So, uh, once again, good morning. Good morning, everybody. I think we are going to start our uh, debate uh, session number two. Uh, that, uh, that session will be in French, and you have uh, interpretation from French to English. Please, interpretation from French to English. It doesn't work the other way around. You don't have from English to French, because in our global world, everyone is meant or supposed to understand the English language, but very unfortunately French is no longer a global language. So we do have a translation from English to French. Uh, there is only one option on your, uh, on your headphones, so just take that if you don't understand the French language. I'm my, myself going to, sorry, I'm my, myself going to, uh, to introduce and to change in French. Uh, so, uh, maintenant, uh, je vais uh, passer à la langue. I'm going to switch to French, and uh, this session focuses on uh, ethnicity and a very specific issue, that is to say, should we or shouldn't we, and which are the pros and cons and uh, ethical and technical problems deriving from the use of the concept of ethnicity when producing statistical data. Uh, it is an important issue, I believe, because the idea of ethnicity is uh, uh, coming into the scene um, in terms of migratory studies or studies on migration. So uh, uh, there are uh, there are even papers who speak uh, of migration and uh, ethnicity together. There are journals uh, of uh, migration studies and ethnical studies, and we also see this concept uh, being increasingly used uh, in when collecting statistical data about language, religion, national origin of parents or of the person being uh, uh, surveyed uh, in order to assign a, a, an ethnical origin to a person or sometimes people are asked to declare and choose uh, their own ethnic origin. Also in uh, the social science uh, discourse, uh, the word race uh, is uh, re-emerging. You can find it in very many scientific papers that uh, there are also statistical categories uh, that include uh, race and ethnicity in the United States, for instance. So there's a phenomenon that uh, is emerging while at the same time migration is introducing in and increasingly so uh, cultural and religious diversity and language diversity in our societies. So uh, today's debate is going to focus on both aspects, the ethical aspects, that is to say, should we or shouldn't we um, introduce in uh, uh, statistical data collection characteristics and features that are subjective, but we'll also discuss a technical aspect, that is to say, When you should we use ethnicity to respond to requests or needs for statistical data? And these are temporary requests because a person should be classified the same way for in the same period of time. And there's also a request for geographical stability. So the same person should be classified in the same way in two different geographical areas. We are also going to speak about uh, the effectiveness uh, of uh, statistical data. The way statistical data is, uh, is used uh, is often justified by the fact that uh, we want to protect migrants. We want to protect migrants against the risk of discrimination. And so maybe we have in front of us a tool that allows us to identify discrimination and allows us uh, to provide a solution to discrimination and uh, have tools, uh, for instance, affirmative actions. So these are all the issues uh, uh, on the table that we're going to discuss. And 
they will be discussed by two people we chose as speakers for this debate. And uh, they should represent two different viewpoints. On the one hand, Mr. Velebrun, who participated on a debate about this issue in France, and who represents what we may consider the Republican idea of France of uh, people. And on the other hand, we have uh, Mr. Anatoly Wisniewski, who comes from Russia, with the imperial history of Russia and the multiplicity of ethnic groups, languages, and nationalities as a background. So, Mr. Hervé I'm going to introduce briefly the two speakers, is professor at the École des Hautes Études de Sciences Sociales, founded by Mr. Brodel. He is a demographer is a mathematician as background. He is very well known by the French media because he has been actively participating in the media debates in various um, fields, uh, population, politics, uh, and so on. So he is someone who is known by political decision makers because he often played the role of political consultant, including very recently in the Atali Commission working on the issue of getting out of the economic crisis in France. And together with Mario Monti, who is prime minister in Italy currently. At my right side, uh, Mr. Anatoly Wisniewski, who is a professor, a demographer, teaching at uh, a Moscow University. He is the head of the Demographic Institute of the University of Moscow. Uh, similarly to Avelibra, he participated in several political debates and very actively. He has also been participating to media debates very actively. He also writes on a journal of population studies on the internet and he also works in France because is working at the uh, Ecole d'Etudes. So we're going to do exactly what we did for the previous a session with a lively debate. We're going to start with Mr. Lebrun, and then we'll move to the next speaker. There's no microphone. There's no microphone. In France, it is a bad point for a migrant as told by Demetrios. <laughs> But I'm also a bad migrant. I was born uh, on the sixth arrondissement in Paris, and I now I'm li I live in the fifth arrondissement, <laughs> the other side of the Luxembourg Garden. <laughs> but uh, the topic is different, is, uh, and I will express it in French. Uh, I started giving you some information. You've all heard recently that in the United States, white babies being born are less than 50% of new babies being born. They are a minority, white babies being born. Well, when you look at that information, actually, it's not really whites, it's white non-Hispanics. You've got to know that in the United States, uh, when you fill in your census questionnaire, the first question you have to answer is Hispanic or non-Hispanic. And only afterwards do you tick the box as to race. So 95% of Hispanics uh, tick the white box. So 
Hispanics are 95% white. So now we have a situation in which you can also tick several boxes under the race headline. About 8 million people in the United States tick more than one box of indicating race, 2.6% in other words. So you can say native Indian or black or whatever. And the American statistics of the census took the following solution, which was the old solution. It was called the one drop rule. In other words, and in the age of segregation, even if you had just one drop of black blood, you were considered black or negroid at the time. There were rather famous trials where uh, women with blonde hair and blue eyes were uh, reassigned to the black category of persons because they had one drop of black blood with an ancestor who was Negro. Equally, if people tick two race boxes, white and black, you will be considered black. Almost all responses uh, of mixed race uh, include the white box. If you count the ones that include the white box, there's 77% of them. And so we could equally say that there is less than 50% of the babies born in the United States in 2011 that are white, but also we could say that there are more than three quarters, depending on how we define white. Now, is it easier in other countries to distinguish, to understand who is white, to distinguish the white from the other? And how is this done? This is really what I want to talk about, which is how to classify the different categories. How do we establish categories by which we classify people in terms of race? And then the second problem is the problem of mixed origin, of mixed ancestry. So as far as the first problem is concerned, there is a huge diversity. To answer to this question, Philip, uh, uh, there is no tendency to uniforming the categories. Take, for example, the category white in the UK. It is defined by distinction in the UK by distinguishing it from the category of Asians, which includes Chinese, Indians, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, and are also Asians and then others. Then you have the category of blacks in the UK, which includes African, Caribbean, and other blacks. And then everything else is white. But North Africans, for instance, are white in the UK. This is not a negligible fact, because North Africans, and the word that is used in France is different, but the North Africans are considered separately. France doesn't have ethnic classification, but there's a lot of discussion on this topic in France. And some surveys, the big service surveys done by the INSEE, the National Statistics Office, have created categories. And one of these surveys done by the National Institute of uh, Dem um, Statistical Studies creates origins for migrants, and it demands the origins and the only ethnicity for European migrants is the nation of origin, whether they come from Portugal or Spain or Italy. But when it questions people from North Africa, you are only given two alternatives. You can be Arabic of ethnicity, or you could be Kabylian or Berber. But when you go even further to sub-Saharan Africa as a provenance, their country of origin no longer exists. And the only thing that survives are ethnic groups because they are categorized according to languages. So these are ancient 
ethnic groups uh, such as were described in Greenberg or Theodore or Benga's uh, linguistics atlases from a long time ago. So there's no longer even the opportunity to be Senegalese or Malian or Ivorian, but you could be Pul or Kwa. So there is a very strong ideology as to what a developed and homogeneous nationality means. Because in Maghreb or Turkey, they are already divided and race doesn't exist. It's just a putting together of so-called ethnicities. Now, every time we talk about ethnic categories, these categories reproduce both historical issues, the historical adventure of a country, and the prejudices of that same country. When I talk to you about the English categories, the separation between Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and Indian is obviously a reflection not just of the colonial history of India, but also the history of the migration flows towards the UK. Uh, the Bengalis who arrived in the UK came uh, as a result of poverty, whereas the uh, migrants that came from India came for different reasons. And then let's look at the one-drop rule and the question of mixed origin. This is extremely important. I'm not, of course, going to make forecasts on the future and the growth of migration in the future, but I can say something about the future in terms of mixed origins. I think that will increase. In many countries, we have statistics on mixed marriages, and uh, in those countries, the proportion of mixed marriages is increasing very rapidly. And so we're going to have more and more people whose uh, ethnic origins or whose origins are mixed. Now let's have a look and s at the rules used for defining the origin of people in statistics. In many statistics, the category of uh, mixed ethnic origin is, has polit important political connotations. I'll give you an example, for example. The one drop rule, I've mentioned that, but also the French situation is interesting because the question asked in order to establish the ethnic origin is what language did you speak in your early childhood? Now, if a lot if you answer more than one language, the instructions for the census officials was like the one drop rule in a sense was not to take into consideration French, but to take into consideration only the other languages. Now, if there were lots of non-French languages, take the one that is spoken less by fewer people, the rarest one, in other words. So you can see that, again, this is, this is an anecdote, of course, but it gives you an indication. And I spoke to the person who was responsible for the census, and I asked, why are you using such a complicated system? Why not just ask the person, what ethnic group do you belong to? And the reply from the official of the census was, no, I don't want to ask them that because they will all answer, I'm French. <laughs> So the point was the census was desperately trying to make all these people foreign. Another country is Bra that we can use it in, as an example is Brazil. Brazil had an ethnic uh, categorization in its census. There were three colors originally, uh, white, black, and yellow, the amarillo. And then there were dozens of other vernacular terms for the mixed uh, uh, groups. They were all brought together into a single category called pardo. And 
because there were always people who were saying maybe they should be in the white category, maybe we should be in the black. And so in 1970, five categories were included in the census, the, the uh, white, black, yellow, Indian, which became indigenous, and intermediate, which was pardo. And the researchers, Alberto Magno de Carvalho and Charles Wood, have shown that between the 1980 and the 2010 censuses, more than 38% of those who called themselves black had changed the category. Uh, and so over 30 years, a large number of people insisted on having their categorization changed. And this had also become a very important political challenge because representatives of black movements tried to annex others uh, uh, thinking that mixed, pe mixed origin people were blacks. And if this was sort of like applying a one-drop rule. But if we did do this, uh, Brazil today would be majority black country. So it's a, it's a big, important political issue. Then there's another category, which is the category of blacks who escaped from their state of slavery and went to the Amazon. and. Uh, they built themselves a fortified village called a quilombo, and they received rights, special rights. Uh, they benefit from anti-discrimination regulations. And now there are lots of other blacks who are demanding to be able to benefit from those same rights. And these are, in many cases, many blacks who live in the big cities in Rio de Janeiro or the other big cities in the Northeast. So three concluding remarks. We may also think that South Africa, which is a very important country to examine because it's the country of apartheid, uh, has since the fall of apartheid broken away from this kind of classification. Uh, there too there was a problem of a mixed uh, uh, origins. The blacks were considered the natives, uh, then there were the whites, of course, but then there were also the colored and the Indians. The colored was once again a category where the pre uh, the ancient populations of the Kalahari who are paler skinned than black sub Saharan, normal sub Saharan blacks, and so on. And uh, this also includes some mixed origin people. But the discussion in 1950 on the Population Registration Act, which gave rise to apartheid and segregation, the question was asked whether the one drop rule should be applied. But it was rejected because the idea, the, the, the fear was that just about every white had a drop of black blood in them. And so since it was necessary to keep a group of whites in existence, uh, obviously this one drop rule was not to be followed. So you can understand that it depends on what the situation of the dominant white group is in a country to understand what kind of rules will be applied in defining belonging to certain categories. Race was a social contract, construct, they said. This is very interesting because usually the goal in South Africa was to separate races because they corresponded to social groups. And you will be able to see it in my written paper that there was a, uh, um, a Nobel laureate, a French biologist, uh, who, his name was Alexis Carrel, who said that from now on, and it's important from social, for social classes to become biological classes. This is, it may be very difficult to accept, but after the end of apartheid in 1994, we would have thought that everything changed, but that's not the case. Now, if you look at the census in South Africa, you will find that the same categories are still there. 
there is no longer mention made of races, but there is mention of group of population or population groups. And the definition of the population group is, I can't find it right now, but um, the census officials are instructed um, to ensure that people classify themselves as though they, the same way that they classified themselves in before 1994, or if as if they were born before 1994. So it's the same classification. And this leads me to my final point, which is that once we have entered into a system of classification that is based on ethnic or ethno-racial features, think about the situation in the United States, it's very difficult to break free of this system of classification. It's very difficult. Why is this? Well, there are three basic elements that play a role, and perhaps the third one, as you will see, is the most important, and it will give you the key to this statement. Because it will be used as a basis for many rules and laws, and so to free oneself of this system means also to have to rewrite all those laws and regulations. And secondly, one of the characteristics is that they can frequently be turned upside down. They can be created, as in the United States or in South Africa, to segregate. And when segregation is uh, eliminated, both in the United States and in the United and in South Africa, the system is kept in order to achieve the opposite results, uh, to achieve methods of monitoring of discrimination, to be anti-discriminatory. Based on demographical data in France, for example, what really plays an important uh, role is the fact that a the term race uh, in a book published recently. This is very confusing because a book by a professor of New York University, Anne Morning, shows very in a very interesting manner how in the United States she identified the definitions of race and ethnicity in the United States. 95% of these people give a biological definition of uh, uh, belonging to a certain race. So completely different from the idea we have that it is a social characteristic. Uh, not because of very noble ideals like fighting against discrimination and so on. But the 5%, the remaining 5%, that have this idea of uh, ethnic and racial categories for population, the idea is a minority. For the majority, for the vast majority, it's a biological characteristic. And that is why the laws and regulations need to be kept on the books. And that explains also the possibility of a transition from negative uh, discrimination to positive discrimination and affirmative action. So ethnic categories could be an, could be an idea. Now, one last example in the United States with Kenneth Pruitt who was the director of the Bureau of Census. Uh, we had a Franco-American meeting in Colombia September last year to discuss uh, what is being done in the US and in France to fight against discrimination. Uh, he was very negative to the idea of including this kind of categorization in France. Um, but the Bureau of Census 
has changed things a bit by introducing the category of Hispanic, which in 2001 has cement that people can now choose they state whether they're Hispanic or not, and that under race, they can actually tick more than one box. And uh, now also, they are asked to specify their nationality, Chinese or Korean, under the Asian heading. We're going towards a definition of ethnicity by nationality, I feel, which is the final one of my considerations that I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Three points I'd like to highlight. First of all, the same uh, technique to build a statistical data may um, end up with different outcomes. Uh, this is what you mentioned with your examples. The second point is the question of mi mixed origins, because uh, when you belong to different categories, uh, then uh, you try to have a political agenda that prevails and that is hidden behind uh, these uh, categories in order to preserve the dominating uh, um, ethnic group. And the third uh, point is the resistance and persistence of categories despite changes in government or in regimes. So the same ethnical or racial categories are kept, and the justification is that they can be used for anti-discrimination policies. This is the justification for keeping them. We're now going to listen to Mr. Wisniewski who probably developed a different uh, um, viewpoint. I don't speak English, I'll speak f uh, French. Uh, uh, it may be I need to apologize that my French is not so perfect as uh, the French of Hervé. Uh, uh, donc, uh, je continue en français. So I will switch to French. I have uh, the same opinion almost as uh, Hervé. I am uh, against uh, including ethnicity as a concept uh, in statistical uh, sciences and in uh, statistical data collection about migration. And the main reason is that uh, the function of the statistics is not only to provide information, it is not a cognitive role that statistic, uh, uh, statistics um, play, but it is also a construction role. So statistics participates in building reality or pseudo-realities. It depends on uh, policies. And we can obviously speak about uh, a statistical policy, uh, which is uh, the part of the mainstream policies of the general politics. Uh, I will speak about the experience of Soviet Union and post-Soviet Union Russia. I believe that you all know that uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, the category of ethnicity used to be very important. Uh, it, the fact that you belonged to an ethnic group was even more important than citizenship because formerly the Soviet Union was the union of 15 different independent states or autonomous states. So citizenship was of no interest to anybody, whereas ethnicity was extremely important. It was mentioned in your internal passport. It was mentioned in all the curriculum vitae of people. And any manifestation or expression of the individual in the public sphere was accompanied with the uh, specification of the ethnicity of the person. At the beginning, this importance uh, attached to ethnicity was justified Uh, in terms of positive discrimination, that is to say, the fight against the Tsarist uh, policies before the revolution, the Russ 
Russianization, so to say. But uh, in general, uh, when you uh, when you accept this principle of discrimination, even positive discrimination, you pave the way for negative discrimination. This is what happened in the Soviet Union. All the citizens of a single country were marked by their ethnicity with no possibility for negative discrimination because when there is discrimination, uh, those who discriminate and those who are discriminated, well, this depends on the uh, balance of, of forces, on the power each one has. So. Uh, Pol politics uh, had a strong influence on the social uh, situation, the social reality, and uh, statistics participated in this uh, policy. And what matters here is that the various forms of ethnic uh, discrimination created uh, the foundations uh, to uh, place uh, ethnicity at a, in a very high position amongst uh, the various components of an individual person because there are various components in our identity, in the identity of people, the identity of society. But if you have this ethnicity principle that predetermines everything, then it, this principle becomes overruling. So the, the ethnicity undoubtedly played a very, very important role in terms of integration of the Soviet Union because obviously each individual belonged to a specific ethnic group. And in Russia, in post-Soviet uh, Russia, uh, we, we again find uh, this idea of ethnicity, which is very dangerous for the country to be really united. And ethnicity was included in all surveys as a fifth item. After the year of birth, your sex or gender, and then there was ethnicity. This was abandoned, and now in our internal passports, we no longer have ethnicity as an item. But what is interesting is that in Russia today, there are very many people who keep insisting on uh, in reintroducing this uh, principle or this item of ethnicity in the internal passport. Uh, it is interesting to see this. There is a, a debate on the Russian internet about uh, what uh, Paul said in his letters, uh, he said that there are no Greek people, no Jewish people, uh, no circumcised people, no non-circumcised people, there are no slaves, there are no free people, but Christ is all and he is in everything. And there are no Greeks, uh, no Jewish, uh, no free people, no slaves, uh, there are no men, no women, because you're all one person in Jesus Christ. And this is being attacked on the Russian internet, this idea of unity. Uh, in, there's now a lot of debate on the interpretation of this letter. Because if you interpret it as if there's no Greek and no Jewish and no ethnicity, you may even go further because St. Paul said there's no man, no woman. And uh, you cannot deny the existence of two genders. Uh, you cannot deny that there are men and women on earth. 
so you will find a lot of debate on the Russian internet uh, uh, on this letter by St. Paul. According to me, neither St. Paul uh, nor those who refer to his words uh, deny the existence of ethnicity. They do not deny the existence of men and women. It's a matter of place uh, and uh, uh, ranking of these items amongst other values. Uh, so what should be more important? Uh, um, should ethnicity be the most important value or not? Um, this is the crucial issue here, because when we speak about the place of ethnicity, well, statistical data official statistical data increase the importance of this factor amongst other factors. And this is a really a primeval attitude uh, uh, that places ethnicity at a, at a very, very high position. Uh, and this also has an impact on migration because, and not only migration, but uh, it affects all citizens coming from other countries. But when it comes to migration, until 2008, in our statistical data, we had the ethnic origin of migrants, uh, migrants to Russia. And uh, after that, it was uh, set aside because, as I said, uh, uh, we no longer had uh, ethnicity on our internal passports, so we didn't see a reason why this item should be included in our census or in our statistical data. But you cannot deny that uh, there was a loss of information, a loss of knowledge uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the cognitive or, or knowledge function that statistics has to play. And this is important. That was important for Russia. For instance, in terms of nationalism or nationalistic attitude, because for irrationality, sometimes prevails on rationality. And, and if you have statistical data in your hands, you can see that the composition of uh, post-Sovietic migration in Russia uh, was uh, mainly composed of uh, uh, Belarus uh, people, about uh, uh, Ukrainians, uh, so people who lived in uh, the Soviet republics in the past and went back to Russia after um, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So uh, there were also Tatars uh, and other people from uh, the Central Asian republics uh, who lived in Russia. And since we no longer have ethnicity in uh, our censuses, we no longer have data and information about uh, the ethnic composition of uh, Russia. So there is a loss in terms of uh, data and information. And it is clear that uh, this is a problem pertaining not only to Russia, but also to France. Uh, we don't know the fertility rate, for instance. Uh, uh, We don't know whether in France the fertility rate is higher than in other European countries because of migration or not. So I cannot say that uh, ethnic statistical data is, of, is, is totally useless, but I believe that the disadvantages uh, are much bigger than the political advantages that you can derive from uh, this kind of data. So the disadvantages are much bigger than the advantages you can derive from um, the provision of ethnic statistical data. I'd like to add that, generally speaking, ethnicity, and I agree with uh, Hervé on this, uh, is easy to be misunderstood because you may understand it or see it as a collective identity. 
when people live uh, in the same place, uh, share the same language, the same habits, uh, well, it's easy to understand the concept of ethnicity in this way. But when these people leave their community and become migrants, uh, then they change their habits, they start changing their language, which is maybe the most important feature in ethnicity. But if someone migrates to another country, he or she starts to learn another language and their children will have the receiving country's language as their mother tongue. Uh, sometimes they keep uh, um, the um, language of their parents, sometimes they lose it. If we look at uh, the migration in Russia during the revolution period, the Russian people who migrated to France, well, very few of uh, their children uh, can speak Russian. And then you also start changing your habits, uh, your customs. And so it's not uh, something permanent. And Also, the same, the same process uh, uh, can be found uh, during uh, massive urbanization phenomena in Europe uh, when uh, um, people left uh, rural areas, left uh, the countryside, uh, they moved uh, to uh, urban areas and they started losing their uh, language of origin, uh, they started changing their habits uh, and, the, for instance, their fertility rate was higher because in the countryside the fertility rate was higher and when they moved uh, to cities and towns, their fertility rate decreased. And the same may happen to other people, citizens from other countries. This is the same for Africans who come to Europe or Turkish people who migrate to Germany. There's a decrease in terms of fertility rate. And when people from the countryside move to urban areas, they are considered by uh, statistical data as uh, um, citizens. When a Uzbek comes to Russia or a Turkish person moves to Germany or to France, in terms of uh, statistical ethnic categories, they will remain forever uh, as belonging to a specific ethnic group. So the approach is very different. If you move to the countryside, um, from the countryside to a town, you don't change your, um, you do change your, your ethnic group, so to say. If you move from one country to another, you don't. So to conclude, and to speak about the possibility of stabilization of certain situations in receiving countries. Well, ethnic uh, statistical data is important there because uh, the process of integration of uh, migrants uh, in the receiving country, in the receiving society, has to be as smooth and and as easy as possible. Uh, but uh, the, a lot of uh, uh, factors that uh, uh, favor and foster uh, the marginalization of migrants uh, socially, politically, culturally and uh, you can in history we've seen uh, ghettos and diasporas uh, and so uh, having uh, ethnical uh, statistics doesn't help with the integration of people in the country of destination when we speak about migrants. And on the opposite, we should try and avoid uh, segregation in uh, any possible way. Uh, I think we shouldn't uh, reject the idea of studying uh, the situation in a country. We shouldn't reject the idea of collecting data about uh, migrants uh, and maybe also their origin. And uh, uh, 
belonging to an ethnic group is uh, maybe it's a bit different than asking a person to tell uh, the where he or she comes from but uh, statistical data international statistical data uh, official statistical data shouldn't take into account ethnicity in specific surveys in specific analysis maybe you could include uh, ethnicity especially if you for instance want to measure certain uh, evolutions uh, of certain phenomena but otherwise uh, you should not include uh, ethnicity and i would like to quote an author amartya sen that i really like who wrote uh, that uh, uh, newly arrived migrants uh, may be encouraged to keep their traditional lifestyle and they could be discouraged directly or indirectly and I think this uh, involves both the country of origin and the destination country they could be discouraged to change their behavior should we then derive that uh, we should uh, encourage uh, cultural uh, conservatorism and should we ask people not to try to adopt new lifestyles even if they have good reasons to do so well I would like to conclude with uh, what Amatia Sen said that is to say the freedom of cultural choices is more important than the concern uh, of keeping a static uh, cultural diversity. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Anatole. Donc... Thank you, Anatole. Once again, three points from your speech. The first is this distinction that you've drawn between the two distinct functions of statistics. One is knowledge, to add to our knowledge of society, and the other is to build society, to construct society. And then there is the question of the political issues behind that construction. The second remark is the multiplicity of identities. The same person can have a number of different identities. Uh, you said this in a different way from uh, the way Hervé Le Brun says. Uh, ethnicity exists, but it's not a sufficient reason to give it an important place in statistics. That's what you said. Because to give it a place in statistics is to risk to provide the tools with which to build negative discrimination. Your third point that I want to highlight is the fact that it's a collective identity and the fact that it can change along with individual experiences. And you distinguish between belonging and origin. So it is you do not belong in an unchangeable manner to a category of origin. So you cannot have, the two things are distinct. Now, in the discussion, there is a question I want to ask of both of you, and then other people can ask questions as well. Today we have this justification that is broadly given to the taking into consideration of ethnicity in statistics, which is, it's is useful in fighting against discriminations. We cannot say that discriminations do not exist. They do exist. We know that migrants are victims of discrimination rather more than non-migrant people. So what do you suggest in order to be able to identify discrimination and therefore fight against discrimination legally? and to monitor the effectiveness of the provisions taken in order to fight discrimination. How do you think you, this can be done if we do not collect data on the category of people? 
So we can open the discussion. It's in English as well as in French. Uh, there is no problem with that. I think both of you understand English perfectly. Uh, and uh, so I see many hands because... <laughs> so let... let... Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, which really give food for thought. And I think the, the, the interesting learning about is that uh, there is no single identity marker. There is no single identity marker for ethnicity. So it can be religion, like in Northern Ireland. It can be language when you go to Belgium. It can be the color of the skin, however it's perceived. Uh, it could be descendant. So that's everything is possible, and it's not a given. It depends upon the historical context, which of these identity markers prevail over others. That's very important. Now, we, you can discuss this in the context of a local culture or several local cultures, and you can dis discuss in the context of migration, where you import one concept that is locally organized into another concept that is also somehow locally organized, and then look at the interference. Because this uh, example of the Kabylian identity, or then to say, no, I'm not Turkish, I'm Kurdish, yeah, when you say uh, yeah, you're from Turkey, shows how this interferes and then maybe develops on um, uh, further at, at the place. Now, for the sake of the question, Philippe, that you have posed, it's not necessary to look into ethnicity um, in a migratory con concept, because it, for the measurement of migration, it would be sufficient to know where the place of birth of a person, or if you want to look into a second generation, you could ask where the parents have been born. and then again, you already get kind of a metissage element into it. So it's only in the context that Anatoly has uh, suggested when you want to do a deeper socio-cultural analysis, you need that kind of construction. Now, if we look into the future, I think the elements that Anatoly has said should be elaborated at. I think the idea is that many people in the context of migration don't have just a single identity. You really need to live in a ghetto in the receiving country in order to fully maintain your identity of origin, as in this Amartya Sen sense, as a voluntary act or being encircled there uh, to maintain you. By, by, by force of, of, of events, you start developing mixed identities. And I think the important thing, and this is hard to measure, is it's probably contextual. So if you're sitting on Sundays or Fridays, depending on your religion, with your parents at home, yeah, you are more bound to the identity and culture of origins, whereas when you go out in the streets on Saturdays and party with others, uh, you're more into the other. So it's contextual. And it can be both. Yeah? So you, you cannot pin down people to one, like we try it with gender yeah? or with age. You're either 50 or 51. You cannot be... Hmm? something in between or both at the same time. Uh, and this is why I think we have, if we think forward-looking, we need to, to analytically look into concepts that allow for this kind of uh, choice, element of choice. It doesn't help with discrimination. So I think one, one needs a measurement of discrimination in order to show it or to prove it. But you're always in danger of reinforcing existing concepts by perpetuating them if you give them not only a statistical but also a legal meaning with consequences. And it can be positive or, or, or negative. This is, uh, you can't escape that. Thank you. Um, my name is Costanza Hermann and I'm from the Open Society Foundations and formerly a PhD here. I worked on the race directive, so my question is linked to the implementation of this important piece of legislation. Um, towards the end of the 90s, most uh, continental um, countries in Europe have adopted race equality legislation, no? On the, well, also because they had to implement EU legislation on that. And uh, this happened around 2000, and now we have a record that is that these pieces of legislation are not very much used. Because I think one part of the explanation is that race identities are so confused in Europe, and there is little recognition of race identities. You were mentioning place of birth as a meaningful uh, measure of the diversity of a person or on whether it could be discriminated against. But I'm not totally convinced that this would work. If you think about Rome and Europe, they have been residing in European countries for uh, centuries now. And even in France, I think we cannot speak about second generation 
French we have to speak about third, fourth, fifth generation French. So are you really sure that place of birth and citizenship of the parent would work for everybody in the context of fighting discrimination or is there something more we can do? The second point is about single identities and mixed identities, which we have been discussing today. I, I recognize that the question of métissage and on how we define this category is really crucial, but if the purpose of classifying these people is really to understand the extent of their labor market inclusion, whether they are discriminated against, etc., isn't it more important to understand how they are perceived from the outside and therefore to make a practical assumption about their identity rather than really taking into account all the identities that they feel. I think that um, a flexible definition of categories, a definition which would also be um, revisable at some point, and by the example you show in Brazil and in the States, I think you show that to some extent we can revise these categories as well as we can revise affirmative action policies. This is the case currently in the United States. So don't you think that a flexible definition, which you know, takes into account the reality of how people are perceived in one state, Romanians and Albanians are discriminated against in Italy but not in other European countries. Don't you think that such compromise could be useful in the purpose of fighting discrimination? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to bring my views also, uh, which are uh, more related to, to the EU context. In the EU context, we have uh, three major categories uh, which uh, describe different populations. If you look at the migration legislation, they refer to third country nationals. When we are dealing with migration in uh, Director General of Employment, for instance, we are looking more to foreign-born, which are not the same population. It's enough to compare Germany with France, for instance, to understand that we are not talking about the same population. But the policy implications, uh, and also, if we are looking to this dif uh, variability in, in Europe in terms of policies, of naturalization. How we can establish comparisons? If we take one definition or the other, it makes an enormous difference. And, and then uh, the key issue is also uh, the, the children of migrants and the, the descendants in general, who very often maintain in terms of integration the same problematic with uh, the migrants themselves. We know also a lot, uh, there is a lot of literature about the poor performance of second and third generation, which is an issue in Europe. So, um, to add to this complexity, we have the, the, the EU mobile workers who have a different status in terms of, of rights across Europe. And therefore, although they faced similar problems in terms of language, uh, integration, etc., etc., they have different rights. So, uh, my question is how to handle in statistical terms uh, and in analytical terms these, these, these big differences which, which are more evident um, than ethnicity, I would say, in, in, our, in our everyday uh, policy work. Thank you. Merci infiniment. Uh, I can't, we can't hear him. Over and above the topics concentrated on migratory statistics, over and above this, I feel that to take into consideration ethnicity would make us take a step backwards because the principle of non-discrimination would be, is rooted in international human rights law. And it is one of the pillars, indeed, of international human rights law. 
And in any case, who is it who is going to define the race, the ethnicity? I don't think there is such a thing as an objective criterion on which we can base ourselves to draw up such a definition. It would be left up to the discretion of individuals. Furthermore, migration has reinforced understanding among peoples But if we now were to include these elements in our statistics on migration, we would be doing the contrary. We would be damaging understanding between peoples, in other words. Now, even distinguishing people according to nationality, because now international human rights law states that there can be no discrimination based on nationality. So, so if we base ourselves on ethnicity and race, this becomes very dangerous. We could base ourselves on citizenship, but only with certain conditions. Now, my question is, are there international statistics today, or national statistics today, based on ethnicity and on race? I am sure that if this were addressed in international law, it would be considered in violation of uh, discrimination in international law. But more, I'm afraid, because it's already 1 and 10. So, Christine, perhaps? Yeah. Thank you. Be uh, short. OK, I have a comment. Um, I respectfully 100% disagree with the scholars that um, somehow ethnicity is promoting discrimination, especially in the migratory context. Um, I'm from the United States, so I will give the U.S. as an example. And the U.S. has a federal and a state system. And every year the federal government has to determine how it's going to spend its money throughout the states. And if the states can show that they have large migrant populations or their foreign-born populations have increased or the Hispanic population, Latino population, Middle Eastern population, then these places are eligible for funding. These places are eligible to be funded for language programs, for integration programs, for um, assistance with legal papers, for immigration papers, family reunification. And also, um, I don't think that census really, census information promotes discrimination. Rather, I think that poverty and cycles of poverty promote discrimination. So minorities and many migrants, they're born into poverty, and it's hard for them to get out. And so is census information really promoting this discrimination? No, I, I think it's, it's something else. And that's the only comment I wanted to make. If you, yes, Bella. But Yeah, I think I'm probably reinforcing what the previous speaker was saying, and, and, and you also, Philippe, uh, talk about uh, uh, alternatives. Uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a bit of confusion here, because I don't think the purpose of asking ethnicity in a census is to measure migration. I agree with Reinhardt that when we want to m measure migration, we look at place of birth. Maybe uh, I think citoyenneté is very important because whether you're a legal citizen of the host country or not has huge implications. But the purpose of, of the census in asking ethnicity is redistribution of resources. The purpose is discrimination. We have to discriminate between those groups who need resources and those who don't. So my question is, the alternative, instead of ethnicity, is just socio-economic status measured in terms of income or such variables, and uh, not enough. Apparently, it's not enough for those persons who want to redistribute wealth. So my question is, what is the alternative? Thank you. Well then, 
I'm going to give three or four minutes to each of our two speakers so that they can reply to all these questions. Irvi, microphone, microphone. Remark on the need of uh, getting information, of scientific knowledge. Well, we know relatively well the economic inequalities. And uh, the fact that we know about them has not uh, allowed us to overcome them. So simply to say that knowledge uh, is sufficient in order to fight against something is uh, seems to me false. Then, if I'd had more time, I could have showed you a PowerPoint where I could have shown you that the inequalities between black and white uh, increased between 1972 and 2010. Now. Lots of arguments have been given, but this goes back to the question asked at the beginning by Philippe. There is no way of having an international classification of these issues. We really got to abandon the idea that we could have an international classification. And I tried to prove this because any kind of classification will refer to the history and the social condition of each country. So each country will do it the way it pleases. And it, within each country, what's important, uh, there is no solution that can be found simply by a census because everything then depends on the problem that needs to be addressed. Classifications are not the same according to the different problems. Take in France an example, which was identity controlling or checking by police. Uh, police check the identity of the blacks and the people from North Africa much more than others. They have 30 seconds uh, to choose the policeman, and so they look at the color of the skin, uh, the, the hair, and perhaps also the Close. Now, if you take the commitment, uh, the hiring of a person by a company, it's all different. They will look at the name, where the person lives, so they're different criteria. And every time the criteria are different. And when research is done on these topics, and I agree with Anatole here, we've got to continue to carry out research on these topics, but the categorization and classification chosen for each of these topics must be decided at the beginning of the research. There is no such thing as a universal classification on the issues related to ethnicity, as we call it. Now, very quickly, as far as the question of having to adapt, um, adapt to classifications and categories as time goes by, as time passes, adapt them to the passing conditions and new conditions, that comes into conflict with another issue. Now, it is generally acknowledged that an, it's up to an individual to declare himself uh, of what category he belongs to. We call it self-estimation. Uh, this must not be established from outside. It must be established by the person uh, involved, by the individual. Uh, it's up to the person to decide what, how he wishes to be classified. That's about it. Well, we're in a field where a lot of things are not clear because the situation of the world modern migration is totally new and there's nothing that can that works uh, classification of migrants uh, the quotas uh, distinction between the state of origin ethnicity nothing is well defined yet nothing is clear enough uh, to systematically describe the situation we are in. I believe that the main point to answer to René is that there are multiple identity factors and I like to stress that there is a hierarchy 
of all these elements. And this is what matters, to decide what is a priority, what is more important. First of all, I'm an American, then I am of a Latin origin, or am I first of all a Latin um, of origin and then an American citizen? We have to define the ranking, the order. Coming to the definition of ethnicity, um, well, in, in Russia, there's a sort of uh, migrant-phobic feeling at, uh, at the moment. And the ethnic, uh, the Russian ethnic nationalists don't uh, distinguish between the Tajiks or Uzbeks and so on. For them, it's a, it's an, an it's a mass of people they cannot make distinctions about uh, who are migrants uh, and of a different origin and sometimes when there are problems political problems between the russian and georgian government the georgians become the enemy then there's a problem with estonians and the estonian government and the russian government and the estonians become the enemy this is what the nationalists think coming to the census where in russia you can no longer answer to this question that you still have the item the heading ethnicity but it's impossible to answer to this question so i believe this is a, a topic it is a discipline that needs a lot of thinking and then coming to the classification of migrants and the classification of uh, migration flows well, yes, the state and the country matters because there are quotas uh, that are defined by some countries. And then coming to resources available and discrimination. In the Soviet Union, you had uh, advantaged ethnic groups compared to other groups. So you were an advantaged group if you came from the north because there was positive discrimination in favor of those groups. Uh, there were jobs uh, that were um, reserved uh, for these people and so on. But uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we saw that the Russians, who had a privileged position, started the changing their identity in the various republics. For instance, in Ukraine, a lot of Russians uh, started to develop an aversion towards Ukrainians. So when there is a positive discrimination, people adjust to it. So I don't believe this is the solution. I hope I answered to your questions. Well, thank you very much, both speakers, for this lively and passionating debate. Uh, even if the conclusion is a bit pessimistic, that is to say it's difficult to fight against discrimination. And on my right-hand side, I hear the speakers saying that even the tools you have to fight against discrimination can be manipulated and uh, turned uh, um, upside down. So it's, it's, it's really difficult. And it is the task of social science uh, to provide different solutions and responses uh, to these uh, problems. So uh, now we're going to break for lunch. Uh, from now until uh, uh, 2.45, uh, may I urge you to, to be very precise. Uh, we start the official opening of the Migration Policy Center with keynote addresses at 2.45. So please try to be here perhaps uh, five minutes uh, before schedule instead of five minutes uh, behind schedule. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup.